Toyota has taken plenty of heat lately for being slow to the electric vehicle game. The world's largest automaker has instead focused on hybrids and hydrogen models, and only lately has cautiously introduced battery electric vehicles. Automotive analyst Sam Abel Samid of Telemetry, an automotive consulting firm, says the strategy is sound given the markets where Toyota is strongest, but the company's approach has been poorly communicated. Sam is a huge fan of automotive racing, so we naturally discuss Toyota's recent launch of the GRL H2 racing concept that runs on minus 253C liquid hydrogen. Welcome to the interview, Sam. Hey, it's good to be with you again, Markham. How are you today? I'm just fine. Good to have you back. Um, over, uh, recently, uh, Toyota uh, announced its GRLH2 racing concept, which doesn't sound very sexy, but I know my uh, social media feeds are all abuzz because this is an internal combustion engine hydrogen approach, and people are saying, oh, it's going to blow electric vehicles out of the water. Uh, what's your take on that? So um, Toyota, this is actually not new for Toyota. Uh, Toyota has been experimenting with uh, combustion hydrogen, hydrogen combustion engines for several years now. Uh, they've been running uh, some Corolla GRs uh, with hydrogen combustion engines in Japan, some racing series in Japan. Uh, and the ACO, the organization that runs the 24-hour Le Mans, uh, has been pushing to a move towards uh, hydrogen for a number of years now. And this is the Toyota's latest concept. Um, the problem with hydrogen combustion, uh, it's true, hydrogen combustion does produce no greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the downside of hydrogen combustion is because hydrogen uh, burns at about twice the temperature of gasoline uh, or diesel fuel, um, it actually produces quite a bit of NOx emissions. Uh, which, you know, you, there's ways around that. You, know, you can do uh, NOx traps like we've done in, in diesel engines, for, for example. But uh, it's not a completely clean uh, approach. The other challenge is, you know, with this race car, the GRH LH2 that they just unveiled, uh, is using liquid hydrogen, um, which is more dense than gaseous, compressed gaseous hydrogen, which is what we have traditionally used on most fuel cell vehicles. Uh, but it has to be in a cryogenic tank, uh, which is at relatively low pressure. And uh, even in, a, in the best insulated tanks, the uh, hydrogen, you know, to be liquid form has to be, I think, about minus 260 plus degrees Celsius. Um, and so it's still going, the heat fuel is still going to warm up. And then because it's a low pressure tank, it has to be vented off to the atmosphere. So it's fine if you're going to use it right away. But uh, I don't know if you remember back around 2007 or 8, uh, BMW had a test fleet of uh, uh, hydrogen combustion 7 series sedans. And uh, those, if you left them parked for about a week, all the hydrogen would boil off. I, I think that that's my perception of this, Sam, is that hydrogen as a fuel is the weakness of this system because it's we don't have a distribution network. Uh, it's expensive at this point. Mm -hmm. Hy electrolyzers haven't come down. Uh, if electrolyzers ever do get down to a dollar or two a kilogram, uh, then you need a lot of water, uh, which is a limiting factor. So it it seems like there are complications in this technology that make it that restrict them on the number of applications. But Toyota says, you know, they, they've been around for a long time. They're very smart. And you got to think, well, they, what do they know that we don't know? Well, a lot of, you know, uh, Toyota has been a big promote, proponent of hydrogen fuel cells for a long time. Uh, you know, and right now, you know, they've in recent years, they've turned more attention to combustion because you've got an existing infrastructure of engines. The engines are relatively inexpensive compared to fuel cell stacks. Um, you, as you mentioned, we still have the problem of hydrogen production and distribution. There's ways around that, um, for example, um, doing uh, hydrogen production, combining hydrogen production with desalination in very sunny coastal areas. Uh, you can take seawater and desalinate it and then uh, also crack that to produce hydrogen uh, and uh, ship that around. Uh, that's that's one solution that is relative, you know, relatively low CO2. But overall, it's still... Uh, problematic. So what you know, what one of the areas where Toyota has really turned their attention is towards using hydrogen for long haul trucking. 
um, where batteries still are not necessarily the best solution just because of the mass of batteries that you have to have, the amount of batteries you need for uh, an 80 ton tr or 40 ton truck uh, is, 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 and the char charging of that is problematic. So uh, a lot of their focus on the fuel cell side has been on the trucking area where the relatively fast refills and the limited areas, the limited road network that you're going to use those trucks on makes it a little easier to start building out an infrastructure as opposed to the consumer application where you, by necessity, need to have hydrogen stations everywhere. Yeah, there was a, a couple of years ago, I did an interview with uh, the Edmonton transportation manager, and they had just begun a test of hydrogen buses because they had a bunch of electric buses, but what they were finding was that the, uh, the charging infrastructure around it was a limiting factor for them. So they were looking at alternate fuels and they didn't keep them very long. They found they just really uh, didn't work. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, supply of uh, hydrogen was a, was a major problem. Uh, another pro project in Alberta is testing long haul trucking. That doesn't seem to be going very well. Uh, is the technology likely to evolve to the point where it becomes economic? It doesn't appear to uh, be the case at this point. I, I think what we're going to see is it will um, start to grow from certain specific areas, like, for example, Southern California. Uh, and, uh, you know, and actually even Northern California is an area where we're seeing a fair, a fair amount of use of hydrogen trucks. Uh, Toyota's, most of their efforts are focused around the port of Los Angeles, the port of Long Beach. Uh, Hyundai has a fleet of several dozen trucks uh, running out of the uh, port of Oakland. Uh, and uh, they've recently, uh, at their new Savannah uh, assembly plant in Georgia, where they build the Ionic 5 and the Ionic 9, uh, they're starting to use uh, their Exient hydrogen trucks there uh, to deliver goods back and forth between the factory and the port, uh, and they're installing hydrogen infrastructure there. So I think what you could see is a gradual build-out of the hydrogen network over time. Uh, so you know, limited areas where you're using the hydrogen tractors, gradually building out that network from there to expand the, the use case. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's still probably not something we're going to see in really widespread use until sometime in the 2030s. Sam, um, before we started the interview, you were telling me about a conversation you had with Toyota a few years ago about their general hydrogen strategy. Maybe you could tell my audience about it. Yeah, it's it's more of a, a broader uh, discussion about their their overall electrification strategy, um, which uh, you know Toyota is not uh, traditionally has not been a big fan of battery electric vehicles. They're obviously very big into hybrids and and to a lesser degree plug in hybrid vehicles. And uh, they came up with what they call the 90 to 96-1 rule. Uh, and essentially what that comes down to is, you know, if you do the math, for the amount of raw materials that go into a single battery electric vehicle bat uh, battery, uh, you can produce 90 batteries for hybrid vehicles or six plug-in hybrid vehicles. And um, when you, if you actually start to do do the math of how much reduction in uh, greenhouse gas emissions you have from a single uh, a single um, battery electric vehicle versus 90 hybrid vehicles, you're actually going to get substantially more um, reduction in emissions from 90 hybrids than you would from a single BEV, uh, or you know from several you know from several uh, plug-in hybrids versus a single BEV because of the way we actually use vehicles, and so. The math actually works out that at least in the as a stepping stone, hybrids and plug-in hybrids are uh, a, a really good approach that will actually have a greater a greater environmental impact in the near term uh, than focusing all of our putting all of our focus on on EVs. Um, over time, as EV technology gets cheaper, as batteries get cheaper. We, and as the infrastructure, the charging infrastructure gets built out, then you can continue to transition to EVs. And, and that's what Toyota is doing. You know, so they are increasingly making uh, hybrids the default powertrain on new vehicles, like the recently announced uh, 2026 RAV4, uh, also last year on the, the Camry. So they've got about half a dozen cars that they sell in, in North America now that are available as hybrid only, or in some cases, hybrid and plug-in hybrid. And uh, then um, 
they're also introducing more EVs. At the same time, they announced the RAV4. They also uh, put a significantly updated, uh, improved version of the BZ, uh, or BZ, I should say, uh, for, for, for your fans, uh, and also uh, a couple of other variants based on that same platform. And there's more EVs coming in 2026 and beyond. So they're, they're, it's not that they're totally not into EVs, but they want to have the, the greatest impact as soon as possible. And what I told them at the time was, yeah, I agreed with, with their rationale, but their messaging around it um, was not great. And it, it got a lot of people riled up who were EV fans, uh, you know, and said, no, Toyota's not into EVs. And, you know, Toyota's not as aggressive on EVs as some other companies, but they're definitely moving in that direction. And they just want to have as much impact as possible as soon as possible. Uh, Sam, uh, we've driven uh, a Toyota for uh, 20 years. We've got one sitting out in the driveway uh, as I speak. And the quality of the car is just unparalleled. I, I've never driven anything else that's been as sturdy and, and uh, uh, you know, goes for as long as, uh, as my Toyotas have. And the company's reputation around engineering and manufacturing, is, they're, the, they're the, you know, top game in town. So it would seem that of all the legacy automakers, that Toyota would be well positioned to transition into an electric automotive future. And do you think they're moving too slow? Because that's what, one of the criticisms of them. Or have they got it just right? I think they've got the balance probably more right than most legacy automakers. Um, you know, because as, as we've seen with others that have tried to move faster, um, you know, the customers are, you know, for especially in a lot of the vehicle segments that they're operating in, uh, are not necessarily ready to move to EVs quite as quickly as as some would like. Uh, you know, we've we've had a lot of challenges around charging infrastructure. You know, uh, poor reliability, not great distribution of the chargers, um, and also the cost of EVs still remains stubbornly high. Uh, so, offering people uh, a stepping stone that you know gives you a thirty to forty percent reduction in CO two emissions. Uh, you know, that they can actually afford today and say, you know, okay, in four or five years from now, when you buy, when you're ready to buy your next vehicle, maybe an EV is the right choice at that point. Uh, so I, I think, I think that their, 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 their strategy is um, given where the market is, is the right strategy. Well, let's finish up the interview by talking about this racing concept. Um, you know, I, I have to admit that that Netflix series on the F1 has got me a little more interested in uh, automotive racing than I used to be. Uh, but this uh, particular concept car is designed at an entirely different uh, what uh, race circuit. What, what can you tell us about it? Yeah, so this is uh, designed as an endurance racing prototype. It's designed to uh, the Le Mans hypercar rules, uh, which are their racing prototypes. Um, and uh, this is a class, this particular rule set uh, was initiated, I think, around 2020, 2021. Uh, and it's become extremely popular. Um, they're, um, currently, all of the, the cars that are running in hypercar, except for the Aston Martin Valkyrie, are all hybrids. Um, and uh, we've been seeing hybrid race cars uh, for, uh, let's see, they launched at Le Mans. The first ones were in 2012. Uh, and one of the things that we saw uh, over the course of the, the 2010s was uh, we had hybrid race cars that were running faster than any of the internal combustion variants that came before, but using half as much fuel to run a 24-hour race. So they were twice as efficient as they were before. Uh, they, they they had more power, more more performance. And um, what they've what Toyota has done with this latest one is they've taken their current uh, GRO10 race car, uh, hyper, Le Mans hypercar, and they've put in uh, a a hydrogen combustion engine in it, in it uh, and a liquid hydrogen fuel system. Uh, so uh, it's the same the same car that they ran just this past weekend in the 24 hour Le Mans, um, but it's powered by hydrogen uh, instead of gasoline. Um, any uh, any uh, insights into the performance of that car versus the hybrid or internal combustion engine variants? 
they they haven't started uh, testing uh, this new car yet. Uh, that is supposed to start happening later this summer. Uh, they're still doing some some preliminary work on it, you know, getting everything fine tuned before they start the full on track testing of it. Um, the goal is to start racing it in uh, about 2028. Uh, so we're still a few years off from racing because they, they as with production applications, they also still have to establish the. Uh, the fueling infrastructure at racetracks to support cars like this. Uh, but uh, various organizations like the FIA and ACO are behind it. They, they want to make a move to zero greenhouse gas emissions from their race series. And um, Toyota is, uh, is behind that with, uh, with their support for hydrogen. Hyundai has also um, indicated that they are interested in pursuing hydrogen race cars as well. Great, Sam. Always good to talk to you. Um, thank you very much for this. Yeah, great to talk to you too, uh, Markham. Have a great day.